Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan Pledge. Um, I'm a curator here at the British Library. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to our event, uh, Standing with Solomon, uh, looking back at the controversy arising from the publication of the Satanic Verses uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, this event is part of the British Library's program for Banned Books Week 2017. Um, Banned Books Week began in the US under the auspices of the American Library Association in 1982 and uh, inaugural UK events uh, was staged last year by the British Library, Free Word and the uh, Literary and Heritage Services for Islington Council. Uh, sorry, beg your pardon, Library and Heritage Services for Islington Council. Um, uh, we're pleased to say this year we've been joined by the Royal Society for Literature, uh, Spread the Word, Index on Censorship and many others and we'll be looking to expand our program next year to promote the freedom to read. Um, as a taste of things to come, I should mention that this event is being webcast live to uh, Exeter, uh, Huddlesfield, Poole and Sheffield as part of the British Library's uh, Living Knowledge Network, so uh, smile. Uh, in uh, the case of Salman Rushdie and the attempted censorship of the Satanic Verses by a religious decree is probably the most famous case of censorship in the last 30 years, um, dealing as it did in its most basic form with the condemning to death of an author for something he had written. Uh, as we will short, shortly hear, Salman Rushdie himself recognised the importance of what had occurred and what it portended, a, predic a prediction that has sadly turned out to be true. Uh, the Sa Salman Rushdie campaign group uh, demonstrated um, the willingness of individuals to stand up for the principles of free speech at any price. The British Library is very proud to hold the campaign group archive, and events like this are a welcome opportunity to demonstrate the uh, value of our contemporary archives uh, beyond their research value. Uh, as well as our distinguished panel, which includes in no particular order, Melvin Bragg, uh, Francis D'Souza, Caroline Michelle, and Yasmin Raymond, I'm pleased to say uh, that in the audience tonight we have the historian and writer uh, Lady Antonia Frazier, who along with her late husband Harold Pinter, uh, was a close personal friend and supporter of Salmon. Finally, before I uh, hand over to the chair for this evening, uh, Lisa Apinion Yezi, I would like to extend a special thanks to our co-sponsors for this evening, the uh, Royal Society for Literature. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, well, it's very good to see you all here. Um, I think this is quite a remarkable gathering of people that we've got here. And I'm going to introduce them not with the full weight of who they are now, um, but also tell you a little bit about who they were almost 30 years ago um, at that extraordinary moment in our contemporary, still contemporary history. Um, when the uh, satanic verses became the object of a fatwa by the Ayatollah Khomeini. So, sitting at the far side from me is Baroness Frances de Souza, who is, uh, was until recently Lord Speaker. But at the time of the uh, fatwa, uh, 1989, she was the head of an organization called Article 19, which those of you who are interested in free speech will know well. She's with monitored and um, championed free speech around the world. Sitting next to her is Melvin Bragg, uh, another lord, um, who I don't think was a lord back in 89, um, and nor were you then chancellor of the University of Lancaster, were you? No, okay, too long ago. Um, <laughs> but who was, even then, our foremost arts and ideas broadcaster and uh, ran a program called The South Bank Show. Um, which was on ITV and which had quite a lot to do with Salman at the time. Caroline Michel, um, who is the most beautiful woman in London, uh, but apart <laughs> from that, <laughs> was back then too, and um, uh, is the head, the CEO of, uh, of uh, a literary agency called Fraser Dunn. I'm going to get it wrong, Caroline. Peter, Peter Fraser, Fraser and Dunlop, thank yep. you. Um, is also chair of the British Film Institute now and the Hay Literary Festival. At the time of the fatwa, she was the publicist at Faber and Faber, a very important publisher. And Yasmin uh, Raymond, who's sitting next to me, is the CEO of the Greenwich Inclusion Project and was named Secularist of the Year in 2017. I think she's too young no, to... No, I'm not. I'm seriously <laughs> not. <laughs> All right, she's not too young, but she's certainly younger than me. <laughs> well, I, at the time of the fatwa, um, unlike this hoary age that I have now reached, was the Deputy Director of the Institute of Contemporary Arts, uh, which had quite a lot to do 
with Salman, who at that time, even then, was one of our great leading writers, had already won the Booker Prize, and for Satanic Verses itself, uh, had won the Whitbread Prize by the time the fatwa came. So what I'm going to do is I've been asked to give you a little history, um, which I know quite well because I was there, but that's not the case because I remember nothing, but uh, did put together this book called The Rushdie File, which actually documents in through the press around the world um, the events leading up to and then after, immediately after, the fatwa, and uh, quite an extraordinary read it is, as I now see, because, of course, at the time when you're in it, you don't see things in the same way. So right now, I'd like you, for those of you who are under 55, to close your eyes and imagine yourself in a different time. This is a little thought experiment, and it is quite extraordinarily a different time. So um, first of all, the Berlin Wall was, is still standing, and the Soviet Union, though relaxing under Gorbachev, is still in place. Margaret Thatcher is our prime minister, and she figures in the satanic verses, um, which in many respects is also a satire of Britain at the time. Um, Ronald Reagan is just stepping down as president of the United States to be replaced by George Bush the Elder. Soviet troops are leaving Afghanistan after a 10-year-long military occupation. There is no 24-hour news. There is no email. There are no mobile phones. The internet is an idea on paper. What we have are fax machines, those now out-of-date technologies which were instrumental in the rise of Solidarność in Poland and thus the end of the Cold War, and indeed played an important part in this particular story. India is in the midst of growing sectarian dissent um, of a kind which really began the present that we now have. Rajiv Gandhi is prime minister. Few in the UK speak publicly about their religion. I think that's one of the things that is hardest to remember, if they have any. Certainly not in cultural circles, where most are public secularists. Religion is very much part of a private sphere. It is certainly not part of the decade's identity politics, which include blacks, a term that also back then covers people from India and Pakistan. And we do think in terms of geographic regions, certainly far more than in terms of religions. Um, identity politics is about blacks, gays, and women. Class is still in the picture, but the so-called cultural turn is displacing it. And I think it, class is only beginning to have a comeback in the last few years. Censorship is something we associate with the Soviet bloc, with Zamestat, or with Nazi book burning. We had a lot of Zamestad events at the ICA, I remember. Or we think about the Papal Index, already a very dusty and unheeded black, uh, blacklist, which included amongst many, 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 many titles, all of our literature, basically, uh, also Simone de Beauvoir. But nobody pays heed to the um, Papal Index, I think, very much, certainly not in France or here. Britain still has a rarely used, only once in my time, uh, for a gay Christ image, blasphemy law. Um, um, we got rid of that blasphemy law when I was still at Penn, I think. <laughs> um, but calls for censorship, and calls for censorship come largely from the Mary Whitehouse Brigade, who are interested in banning four-letter words and smut, and that was the word that was used from our screens. Offense is not something people feel as a matter of course. And it is certainly not an indictable wrong. It's a term associated, I remember this very, very clearly, with an uptight right wing. To offend, to disturb, is what all artists are meant to do to make you think, to make you see the world afresh. Satire is crucially important. To disrupt your preconceptions and prejudices, that's why it's there. Fundamentalism is not part of ordinary vocabulary, except to refer to some very odd Christian groupings in the US. Nor is the word global in great currency. We didn't yet have a global world. We haven't even reached Francis Fukuyama's adage of the end of history uh, in order to enshrine an other, arguably no better one. Salman Rushdie really is one of our greatest writers. He's won the Booker for The Midnight's Children. He's been shortlisted for the brilliant book Shame. Um, he's one of the stars, and I stress this, of the anti-racist 
movements. He's core amongst anti-racism campaigners. And he is a very fine public intellectual, one of our best. Um, it's very sad to me that he's now in the United States and we don't get quite so much of him here. He's also, of course, a friend of mine, as he is of many of the people on this panel. And I just add this before we start properly. When I read his fourth novel, The Satanic Verses and Proof, in the summer of 1988, before it was published on the 26th, I thought of it then primarily as a brilliant surrealist and satirical expose of Thatcher's Britain, a splendid portrayal of what it meant to be a migrant, the inhabitant of at least two bodies and more minds. I knew back then uh, that Midnight's Children had angered Mrs. Gandhi because of a sentence in it which linked her to um, the strand stranglehold her son might have had in her, and indeed she brought a defamation um, suit against Salman in the courts in 1984. I also know that shame is banned in Pakistan, but those countries still feel very far away, something they no longer do. When Satanic Verses is published here, there's nothing at all in the reviews throughout the press um, to indicate why Syed uh, Shahuboudin, an Indian Muslim MP, is trying to get the book banned in India and eventually succeeds. I don't understand why there are mounting de death threats, why the publishers are receiving letters calling for the book to be banned here and in the US. It's a book which many of us, um, even amongst Salman's closest readers, found not his easiest to read. Um, and when there are uh, calls to have it banned in Pakistan, which eventually it is in South Africa, and through we, what we now call, but didn't back then, the Muslim world, this is quite difficult to grasp. Nor do the newspapers report the first book burning by young Muslims in Bolton on 2nd December 1988. We really only hear of local contention in Britain when the book burning in Bradford takes place on January the 14th, 1989. And apparently that book bur burning, um, there's been a lot of research to prove that is the case, was sparked by faxes, that wonderful ancient technology from India and the MP uh, Shahabuddin. So to set us off properly, here is Salman Rushdie himself on the day of the Bradford book burning in January 1989. I'm Salman Rushdie, I'm a novelist. Um, and I, I just have to say that it's, um, this is, for me, it's a very sadly appropriate day to be at an, an event against censorship. Because today, in Bradford, 1,000 militant Muslims met at the town hall and burned copies of my new novel, The Satanic Verses, this one, um, on the grounds of alleged blasphemy. Now, I think many of us will find the idea of burning a book pretty revolting. Um, and I think it's an indication of not only the force of militant Islam in the modern world, but, but also it seems to me of the, that of the growth of the beginnings of, of a movement very like the fascist movements of the past. Um, and I think it's a movement that we all need to take some notice of. It rather changes the political agenda and complicates it in many ways, but there it is. To exacerbate that, I should say that I heard this evening, about a couple of hours before I came here, that in response to this act of book burning, W. H. Smith and Sons have decided to withdraw my novel from, from all their branches in England. Um, in quick succession, through February, there were riots around the world. In Islamabad, six are killed and 100 injured as 10,000 storm the American embassy. America has just published Satanic Verses. On the 14th of February, Iran's revolutionary leader, the Ayatollah Khomeini, seeking to put his stamp of revolutionary Islam on what is happening, sends a killing Valentine to Rushdie and issues a fatwa, a death threat. On the 15th, the great Harold Pinter, together with Antonia Fraser, lead a delegation of writers to Downing Street. A few days later, Rushdie and his then wife, the American writer Marianne Wiggins, go into hiding. He remains in hiding through 10 grueling years under government guard 
and several attempts on his life are foiled. So that's the scene. And I haven't invoked to you anything of what I think will come out here of how frightened we all very quickly became. Um, the barricades went up around Penguin Books and so on. I'll turn over to Francis de Souza now to give you something of the sense of the campaign um, <coughs> for freeing Salman. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. <coughs> uh, let me start by saying there were countless numbers of people who were involved in this celebrated case of censorship, of trying to fight this celebrated case of censorship. There were hundreds of individuals around the world, notably, of course, writers. There were publishers and writers groups. There were non-governmental organizations, notably Index on Censorship, as well as Article 19, all of whom joined in one way or another to fight this because it was as a preeminent case of censorship in the sense that it was attacking a fundamental right, which some of us believe is actually the cornerstone of, of democracy. Um, now, memory is a very funny thing. I'm sure you'll all agree that we each have different memories, and I'm sure that people here will remember certain events very differently. Um, so what I'm really emphasizing is that there were a lot of people involved, but my memory is really just about the campaign to begin with. The Rushdie cam Defense Campaign, eventually called the International Rushdie Defense Campaign, I'll call it the campaign, um, was set up in the immediate aftermath of the fatwa when it was announced on the 14th of February 1989 by my predecessor, who was the director of Article 19. I took over from Kevin Boyle two months later, and that taking over of Article 19 coincided with a poll run by the Daily Telegraph in which the majority of people believed that Salman should apologize uh, for the book. And on the same day, the Evening Standard published a cartoon showing Salman in a coffin. Um, so the offensive had really begun. Now, Article 19, as Lisa has said, existed to promote, promote and protect freedom of expression. And the, the, the purpose of the defense campaign was twofold, to ensure that the fatwa was rescinded and also to alert a wider national, international community of the dangers of censorship and how this case, in that it was symbolic of so much freedom that we fought hard for and cherished, should, should be fought. And one of the messages that we repeated time and time again was the difference between incitement and freedom of speech, because it was an important distinction. Uh, lots of people talked about it being a criminal act, incitement, because it angered uh, the Islamic world or some of the Islamic world. And I go back here in order to explain it in shorthand to the very famous ruling from the US Supreme Court many, many, many years ago in which it was said that uh, shout, falsely shouting fire in a crowded, all of you know this, falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater was incitement because the resulting panic would result in violence and damage and injury. Whereas, of course, uh, sh falsely shouting fire on a street corner is freedom of its speech, a rather bizarre freedom of speech, but nevertheless freedom of speech and not in incitement. The, the strategy um, of the cam campaign group was to exert political, diplomatic and economic pressure. Um, but this could only be achieved if governments refuse to condone Iran's gross abuse of human rights and international law. I think I have to say that from the start, though perhaps we didn't realize it in the first few weeks, but from the start, it was a political campaign dealing with a political issue. And, and Salman Rushdie was the political football in all this. Uh, it, it moved from writer's outrage to persistent political lobbying. The campaign had meetings with government and MPs, and on one memorable occasion with uh, authorities or officials at the Iranian embassy in London, which they subsequently denied had taken place. We held rallies, media events, we published numerous papers and reports, we lobbied the European Parliament and the Commonwealth. Very rapidly, a number of national Rushdie defense groups were set up throughout Europe and indeed beyond. Um, we provided evidence for cases against those who, was, who threatened Salman with violence and documented events surrounding the fatwa and the Stanic verses over the next 3,000 odd days. Meanwhile, of course, um, Salman himself was using his own considerable channels of considerable influence. So there were lots of parallel uh, goings on, as it were. Initially, the Thatcher government was supportive of the free speech principle. Within days of the fatwa, 
Thatcher said our commitment to freedom of expression is unshakable. Uh, and in 1990, she said, religions can survive the comments of a few people who receive publicity because of their adverse comment. That's slightly ambiguous. One wonders who she's talking about there. However, later that year, in 1990, partial diplomatic relations with Iran were restored with the exchange of chargé d'affaires. Thereafter, the consistent message from the FCO to us, and I suppose to others, was uh, an insistence on quiet diplomacy. And I quote, to press loudly for the fatwa to be lifted would be a mistake and reduce chances of securing the British hostages still held in Lebanon. It time and again advised, advised that any publicity would be counterproductive. And the, pl the plan, which I think Caroline may talk about to hold a thousand day vigil was cancelled because of strong uh, uh, advice from the foreign office saying that we, you know, this was a dangerous thing to do. And of course, Iran began to milk uh, this link. Their rhetoric became ever more um, explicit. They said, for example, every Muslim is duty bound to carry out the fatwa. Um, <clears throat> they said that hit squads were being dispatched to murder him. The bounty money from the 15 Cordad Foundation was increased to include material and political expenses. And after the meeting with Clinton, which came a little bit later, uh, they sent out a statement saying that Rushdie is as the goose being fattened for slaughter. One or two UK ministers remained steadfast on the principle involved at least, uh, at least in public. Uh, Douglas Hurd, who at that time was president of the European Council of Ministers, said the fatwa was incitement, I quote, incitement to murder, and expressed deep concern at the failure of the Iranian authorities to repudiate the incitement to murder a British citizen. Douglas Hurd, who was at that time a Minister of State, said people should realize that this is a human rights issue of great importance, and I hope that international leaders and organizations will rally behind Mr. Rushdie's cause. And of course, the Clinton uh, administration was no less supportive, saying, uh, we do not believe it is a private matter, we do not believe that people should be killed for writing books. Terry Waite, the last of the British hostages, was released in November 1991. However, in early 1992, about three months thereafter, a sympathetic mole in the Foreign Office told me that the UK government was considering resuming full and normal diplomatic relations with Iran, in which case, of course, the pressure points would, because Iran very much wanted this, those relations, would, would, would disappear into the mist. So the strategy then became one of mustering as much foreign government support as possible in order to make it difficult for the UK government to renege on, on its support of the principle of free speech. Uh, this involved helping to set up a um, number of visits. First of all, to the so-called uh, softer targets, the four Nordic countries, then Germany, France, Belgium, Ireland, Canada, and eventually the USA and, and the meeting with Clinton. These journeys to 17 countries in all, some of them several times, uh, were somewhat fraught, as you would imagine. Uh, airlines refused to carry Salman, security was over the top. In one case, when we arrived in Germany and we were driven straight from a private airfield into what we eventually realized uh, was a police barracks, uh, where we held because they thought that was the only way to protect Salman and his entourage. Uh, but I think the strategy uh, achieved its aim. And I, again, have to add that there were so many people involved in helping to set up these meetings and, 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 and to make sure that they took place. But it caused the UK government to pause in its resumption of relations with Iran. I do believe that. And the evidence would suggest that vigorous campaigning works rather better than quiet diplomacy. There were times of utter despair, not least for Salman, of course, himself. How could we, as an impecunious human rights organization, uh, raise the resources to invigorate the Rushdie campaign and to actually confront a powerful state with murderous intent? We also had a number of donors who were a little bit unsure as to whether or not we should devote, devote so much time to this. The organization was threatened, we had a sort of a, a mock bomb sent to us. There were all kinds of issues as, as director of, the art, of Article 19 that one had to consider. I have to say also, of course, that there were trustees who were fully in support, and the majority by far. 
the other issue that I think that some of the trustees were concerned about, and indeed so was I, was how could we continue to deal with cases of censorship which range from Southeast Asia through South Asia, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, um, and, and North Africa, of which there were a huge number. This wasn't the only case, as you can well uh, understand. So, uh, my friends, um, I don't have much time. What about the man himself and the book itself? Uh, the Satanic Verses, like all Salman's work, was his cherished baby. Uh, he has since written movingly about how the book was conceived and born, yet daily it was traduced and misrepresented, mostly by people who had not read the book. Uh, the affair was not only acutely political, uh, it was also personal. The toll of almost nine years of hiding or defending his work, of defending himself, was not only heavy, but utterly demoralizing. And it is an, a, a testament to, to everything that he is, that he survived that as well as he did and has gone on to produce such wonderful fiction. Anyhow, my friends, the day came, as some believed it never would, when someone walked out onto the streets of Islington without minders. He was free. And a mammoth struggle to assert freedom of expression lived to fight another day. Thank you. Well, Francis, it was an extraordinary campaign, and I remember a great deal of it. Um, and the nervousness on all sides was tangible. Caroline, you, you were involved in the writers' uh, grouping. So tell us about that. Well, it was, I mean, Francis and her organization led the, um, all the sort of really heavy, heavy lifting in the campaign. But I think when you, when you think about Salman, you think about what can you do as an individual and as a friend. And Salman had many great friends amongst writers around the world and just amongst us, amongst the community. He is, you know, he is someone we loved enormously. And so when this happened, um, Antonia, Harold, Melvin, um, Ruthie, Richard Rogers, Alan Yentob, Philippa, I mean, people, we, we got together a group because we felt as individuals there must be something we could do to make a noise, to use our contacts, to contact writers around the world to say, you know, this cannot be allowed to happen. This threatens our very existence. It threatens everything we believe in. Um, and it's, it's a sort of tribute that I think in those years, and we, we basically concentrated on, we were coming up to a thousand days to three years of Salman not being able to venture anywhere without a funny mask or a silly hat or a, you know, a whole posse of security people. And there was great comedy in the tragedy of it all, too. We, you know, we laughed a lot, as well as being you know, furious about the state we found, you know, somebody who we loved and a writer who we believed in. And so we decided we would hold a vigil. We worked with Francis and Carmela and all of the Article 19 people. We would take over Westminster Hall on the thousandth day of um, the fatwa. And we would have people for 24 hours, a thousand people reading, performing, coming to make a statement about Salman. And we went quite big on it. You know, we had a lot of media interest. We wrote all the letters are actually in the archive here. We wrote to every writer, every politician, every prime minister, everybody who'd come into contact, who, who, had, who had said they would be interested, and, and had the most enormous response. I mean, it was fantastic the way people just, as individuals, rose to stand by him. And, um, and then, as we were getting closer, um, we had these extraordinary, as Francis said, calls from the Foreign Office. And I can remember going to the Foreign Office and meeting people called Campbell Bannerman and Asquith and Soames and Churchill and thinking, are we in a different age? Are they still <laughs> the same people? Are we, you know, is this real? And being told that if we were to go ahead with this vigil, we were going to put um, Terry Waite at risk. And you know, there, was, there was a lot of pressure. And Salman didn't want to do anything to put any more, anyone else under more threat of pressure. So we, we scaled it down. And I remember Harold gave an incredibly moving talk. And we had a few people speak. And we did various um, programs for television where we had um, writers from Seamus Heaney to Gunter Grass to Nadine Gordimer to Doris Hain to everyone, Melvin, all there supporting Salman. And I can remember even involving Geoffrey Archer, going and seeing Geoffrey Archer with Ruthie Rogers. We would try anything. And um, of course, he was <laughs> going a bit far. And I can remember. Um, uh, can I just interrupt, Caroline? I remember Salman saying to Jeff Geoffrey at a conference, Yes, Geoffrey, 
every book aspires to the condition of literature. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought we'd take him up on Ruthie Rogers and I, we, we, we cornered him at a party, and we were always cornering people at parties, trying to get people to, to stand, particularly politicians. So I think by the, you know, by the end of it all, they would see us come into a room and would rush in the other direction. And um, Geoffrey Archer said, come and see me in, in the apartment. So off we went to this, his hilltop, his, um, his palace opposite... Uh, Westminster, and we got there, and of course I was wearing high heels because I never wore anything else. And he said, "You have to take your shoes off. Take your shoes off." And you feel you feel rather vulnerable taking your shoes off in front of Geoffrey Archer. <laughs> and we went, um, we went to sit down, and someone the whole time said, "You know, I really want to know what happens." We went to sit down in his apartment. It, it we had two levels to it. There was a um, a balcony above where we're sitting a posse of, of secretaries. And um, Ruthie and I sat down. He said, well, my lovelies, what, are you, what can I do for you? And we talked about Salman and what had happened and how terrible it was and that we felt that John Major should take notice of this and should make a stand. So he says, he looks up and he says to one of his secretaries, call John, call John now. Tell him it's Geoffrey, call John now. So the secretary dutifully went off, made the phone call, and she came back saying, John's in the cabinet meeting, but he'll call you right back. <laughs> and we never heard another word. <laughs> so, um, and I think there were, there were many instances like that of writers uh, all over the world in every country who would do what they could to try and further the case of Salman through palaces, governments, ordinary people on the street, because it was, it was a time where it was really frightening to see what was happening. It was really frightening to have someone who you love as an old friend and who's a writer who is renowned the world over arriving at your house under police protection. And um, I remember once with someone, he said, God, you know, I can't remember what it's like going to a supermarket and going out to a corner shop, sneaking out from the security <coughs> people. So man in one of his silly hats and him looking at the shelves like this, he couldn't, it had been so long since he'd been able to do something that we take for granted. And I think that's one of the things that I'll never forget of those 10 years, is how extraordinarily brave and, and good-natured and smart he was through it all, and how much pleasure there was from those simple things. And he carried on writing. And I mean, Melvin will tell the story of when he wrote the children's book, Haroon and the Sea of mm -hmm. Stories, um, which, you know, it takes some mental capacity to live under what he lived under and to produce a work of such beauty and such creative storytelling. Mm. So beautiful. And there's another story Melvin, there. Fill us in a little bit from your end. <coughs> well, fill us in a little bit your end at, at the well, campaign I'd days. I'd like to pick up from Caroline. Um, we met, we did a lot of the, these meetings at breakfast and as we were in different parts of London it meant getting up very early to get across to these breakfasts but they were sensationally good and and very, very well driven and organized by you, and you always took a back seat, but actually you were the driver of it all. Um, as a friend of Salman's, when Midnight Children came out, I thought it was um, utterly brilliant and different, and had changed the nature of the re literary relationship between this country and the continent over there. I'd read R.K. Narayan with great pleasure, uh, it was cultivated by Graham Greene in the 30s. He's a wonderful writer. And an Englishman had written about India. Um, we know that, Foster and, and the others. But this was something different. It was a book which came out of the heart of the new India. And it was wonderfully written, uh, com compulsively read to, readable. I knew him a little. I wanted to make a film about him, and, but then so did uh, my, one of my two or three closest friends in London at the time. Uh, and still is, Antonio's cousin, Tristram Pohl. And so graciously or grudgingly, I can't remember which, I said, OK, you do it. And he did it for a different channel, and I, I've never not forgiven him. Um, <laughs> um, and, but I got, so there was that. And then almost as good, I thought, but I was completely consumed by shame. Uh, he sort of did it again, uh, proved that he, <laughs> he really was that good. Um, and that, too, enhanced this enorm already enormous worldwide literary reputation and the opening up of continent and the taking on. And a different voice was there. It's one of the great books of the... Those two are two of the great books of the 20th century. Then came uh, Stunning Verses, which became a cultural and a political phenomenon more than a book. And that more began to obscure the book. Mm -hmm. And that's why people felt that they could talk about the book, as you mentioned quite uh, 
professionally and confidently without having read it, because it, it had ceased to be just a book. It was a thing. Yes. Uh, it was a terrible thing. It was a book that had been burnt for being a book. And writers particularly like myself and here and in every other country uh, were, were um, among the first to see the dangers of that and knew the history of that. Uh, let's not take the obvious history of the book. Let's take the history of this country. Uh, the greatest book published in this country was probably published in 1526, uh, written by William Tyndall. It was the first proper English translation of the New Testament. King James Bible, 93% of it is comes in directly from Tyndall. It was riotously well received, and they burned put the books in their tens of thousands when they could get hold of it. Outside St. Paul's Cathedral, the Bishop of London bought up a whole shipload which had come over from Holland. Tyndall was, was, was self-exiled to Holland and burnt them all in front of It took three days to burn them all. Uh, and people then predicted first the books, and it quite happened, then the people. Uh, soon after that, people were being burnt in St. Paul's at the same place as they'd burnt the books. So one was aware of the, what the burning of the books could lead to. And as you say, there was, the, there was a great fear around it. And, and it's a terrible thing to say, but it was, an, it was a dread, but it was a dread which was tinged with a certain excitement because all of a sudden history, you turned over a page and you were in the middle of something that was, it was, it was a, you, part of a history that you thought you'd outside your, off your radar until that happened. And Antonio and, uh, and uh, Harold were very close friends of his, and my wife and I went around to have supper with them one night when we were not told. That, well, we, I think we were, <coughs> Salman and Marianne were there. That felt like a great privilege, and it was very hedged in, and you felt were, it was a sort of underground movement you were part of. Um, and Antonio and Harold were always very close, close to him and steering him. And then this book came out, this lovely book, Haroon and the Sea of Stories, which if, if you haven't read it, it's a book about, uh, about a sea full of stories and how it, it teaches you how to write stories. It's beautifully written. It's a children's book but written by... It's, it's, it's a wonderful book. I thought, well, if... I hadn't, if he hadn't been in the position he is, I'd have got in touch and said, I'd like to do a program with you about this. So I rang up and said, I'd like to do a program with you about this. <laughs> he hadn't been on television or, as I think, it, but maybe not even live on radio. But he said yes. And I loved his answer when I said, well, I don't quite know where to do it. And, he's, and I said, it's quite dangerous and difficult. I don't quite know where to do it. And he said, your house. <laughs> 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 and I thought... And I thought, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's the way I'm going to do it. Uh -huh. And we, we set up camera crews, went to um, Croydon, supposedly to interview Faye Weldon, but then they came to my house. And the security people came, as has been mentioned, and sussed it out. And they did all the things that you, you hadn't thought they would do, but they did what you actually later thought, oh, well, that's what they do. They come in numbers. They check your neighbours, they look up at the street up and down for two days. There's a man in the back garden with a gun. There's a man in the back room with a gun. Uh, and it's serious stuff. Um, and we did the interview, and, uh, and, and he, was, he was a bit nervous. I was, I was more than a bit nervous. Um, but not just about getting, actually, to tell you, I think if I'm true to myself, to try to get a good interview, because it's quite difficult. But it, it was a good interview, and we did that. And then we came to the, um, to the Satanic Verses. Now, to attempt in the time I've got to summarise the satanic verses, I have to confess, ladies and gentlemen, is way beyond me. Um, but just in brief, it came out in 88. Uh, the satanic verses are a group of Quranic verses that allow intercessionary prayers to be made for the three, uh, for three pagan goddesses. And Salman used that... Robert, can I stop you for just a second? Because... Yeah. I want to play the clip of Salman reading that section before we talk about it. Is okay, that all right? So can we have the clip now? I think it makes more sense. So we're moving on to the satanic. He's, he's, he's been taught, he's been hired to be the scribe, to write down the revelation when the prophet brings it down to the mountain. And after that, when he sat at the prophet's feet, writing down rules, 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 he began surreptitiously to change things. Little things at first. If Mahun recited a verse in which God was described as all-hearing, all-knowing, I would write, all-knowing, all-wise. Here's the point. 
Mahound did not notice the alterations. So there I was actually writing the book, or rewriting anyway, polluting the word of God with my own profane language. But good heavens, if my poor words could not be distinguished from the revelation by God's own messenger, then what did that mean? What did that say about the quality of the divine poetry? Look, I swear, I was shaken to my soul. It's one thing to be a smart bastard and have half suspicions about funny business. But it's quite another thing to find out that you're right. Listen, I changed my life for that man. I left my country, crossed the world, settled among, settled among people who thought me a slimy foreign coward. The truth is that what I expected when I made that first tiny change, all wise instead of all knowing, what I wanted was to read it back to the prophet. And he'd say, what's the matter with you, Salman? You're going deaf? And I'd say, oops, oh God, bit of a slip. How could I correct myself? But it didn't happen. And now I was writing the revelation and nobody was noticing. And I didn't have the courage to own up. I was scared silly, I can tell you. Also, I was sadder than I've ever been. So I had to go on doing it. Maybe he just missed out once, I thought. Anybody can make a mistake. So the next time I changed a bigger thing. He said, Christian. I wrote down Jew. He'd noticed that, surely. How could he not? But when I read him the chapter, he nodded and thanked me politely, and I went out of his tent with tears in my eyes. After that, I knew my days in Yathrib were numbered. But I had to go on doing it. I had to. There is no bitterness like that of a man who finds out he has been believing in a ghost. I would fall, I knew, but he would fall with me. So I went on with my devilment, changing verses, until one day I read my lines to him and I saw him frown and shake his head as if to clear his mind, and then nod his approval, slowly, but with a little doubt. I knew I'd reached the edge, and that the next time I rewrote the book, he'd know everything. That night I lay awake holding his fate in my hands as well as his own. If I allowed myself to be destroyed, I could destroy him too. I had to choose on that awful night whether I preferred death with revenge to life without anything. As you see, I chose life. Before dawn, I left Yathrib on my camel and made my way back to Jahiliya. And now Mahound is coming in triumph, so I shall lose my life after all. And his power has grown too great for me to unmake him now. Baal asked, why are you sure he will kill you? Salman the Persian answered, it's his word against mine. I want to ask Yasmin before coming back to you. Yasmin, when you first read that, did you have any qualms about it? Was it, was it something that disturbed you? How old were you, <laughs> if I might ask? Um, I, was tw I was 22 um, when uh, the campaign started. Um, I'm a Muslim. And um, I'm also a member of Women Against Fundamentalism, <coughs> which is, has now disbanded and we've now become feminist dissent, um, along with Geeta Segal and um, Pragna Patel and others um, of Southall Black Sisters. Brilliant. Um, I read the book and um, I'd loved Shame, absolutely loved it. Um, Midnight with Children, one of my all-time favourite books. I did find it difficult, but I didn't react in the way... Um, that many of my fellow Muslims did. My, my ex-husband, who I was married to at the time, did, and he was on the march um, with uh, the Bradford Council of Mosques, which happened um, in March. And there was a women's march as well, women from Southall Black Sisters, women from Women Against Fundamentalism. There were 40 women who did a counter-demonstration on the day of that march. And um, basically marched against 40,000 raging, angry Muslim men with no police protection, threatened with death, threatened with rape, um, threatened to have their houses burnt down. I had a two-month-old baby daughter. Um, my husband would not have allowed me to go. It was the, the thing that stood out for me, and we've continued campaigning as a group for free speech since that time, as it was the first time that I was ever labelled a kafir, a non-believer. And I was really taken aback as a, as a British-born Muslim. What was this? Did it matter if I was a non-believer? I had no understanding, even at 22, even having, having um, studied Islam and you know, sort of um, working in, in the women's sector and in the anti-racist movement, no understanding the enormity of what that meant. Um, boy, I do now. Um, 
But what I think has been, ha has been really sad, and it's incredible to be here this evening sat alongside you, because I don't know someone, I'm not a friend of you, I feel a bit like an interloper. Um, no, no, please don't. <laughs> is um, that that women's story has been missing from this narrative, and we have continued at grassroots level, challenging communities, often at great risk to ourselves and to our families, um, to keep the story of what happened um, with the fatwa, to raise the fact that we gathered evidence that the fatwa was actually directed from Muslims in Britain. Um, Gita Segel and I um, are part of the Centre for Secular Space, and we interviewed Dr. Giyasuddin Siddiqui, he, um, along with Kareem Siddiqui, set up the Muslim Parliament. I don't know if some of you will remember that. That I was in the late, the late yeah. 80s. And um, we interviewed Dr. Giyasuddin Siddiqui about, probably about seven years ago, and he talked for the very first time quite openly um, about his role in, in getting the, fat, the fatwa and going and visiting um, Iran, speaking to Khomeini directly, um, and having this fatwa issued. And I remember just standing there, knowing what I know and knowing all of the connections between some of the Muslim groups that are operating in the UK and have been for decades. But I didn't know that there was this connection <coughs> and that there were all of these, um, that the connections that we now talk about in terms of the spread of Islamist ideology, um, the... Um, the political connections, the money that flows between different places, I, I just honestly didn't know at that time, whether it was because I was very naive um, or whether it just wasn't public knowledge. I think it was knowledge that was very difficult to find out yeah. if you were not part of those groupings. Yeah. But I know when we, when we did the first two months after the fatwa, mm -hmm. a month and a half after the fatwa, mm -hmm. we held a conference at the ICA. I invited all the Muslim leaders to come um, and to talk about what was going on. And it was quite clear to me that there were, you know, there were the young hotheads, that's fine. But the actual stuff that was happening was not being directed no. from them. Um, and that this was bigger than, you know, the local demonstrations. And indeed, you know, some of them later, mm. I mean, you probably know them better than I do, um, actually said, well, no, it was a mistake. We shouldn't have got involved in mm -hmm. that. Um, but then it took on its own momentum. And I think, you know, the fear in the Foreign Office and the reason that Salman had police protection was that people there, unlike writers and, mm. and you know, local communities, did know that this was something very serious yeah. and part of big politics. And what I do remember is when we put the book together, the Rushdie file, it was quite clear that the first reviews in Iran of the satanic verses thought the book was very good. They didn't think it was as good as Midnight's Children, but you know they thought it was a very interesting book, and they didn't. It was it was available. I mean that you could get it until somebody told the Ayatollah this is a good thing for you to do. Um, so there we go. Mm -hmm. But let, let's. I, I'd like to go back to to the actual reading experience of the satanic verses before we mm -hmm. move on to what's changed in our world because of that um, going on. Did, when you read the book at the time, you didn't think there was anything particularly blasphemous in it. No, but uh, I'm, would I have even thought about anything as being blasphemous? Um, as you said in your introduction, there wasn't that culture of people standing up and saying, I'm offended. And also, even if you came, even if you had a faith, um, your faith wasn't so utterly sensitive that someone writing something that may criticise it would... would would render you kind of apoplectic with rage. Yes. And a book that you might not normally read yeah. in any case. Yes. I mean, you might, yeah. but a lot of people didn't. Melvin, you, you were telling us when you first read the book, I mean, what, what was your impression as somebody who is a writer? Well, I, uh, I agree with what, what you said. I was blind to a lot of the, what later, I think the fact that is, is a, and as I, I think I said this at the beginning, I can't quite remember, it was, it was a different thing from the book. Mm -hmm. uh, to relate the fatwa too closely to the book, I think, is to get the wrong end of the stick. The supreme rule Ayatollah clearly hadn't read it. He'd, have, he'd been advised by people who were very prejudiced, to put it at the least, and they wanted to use it to use him to do that for their political purposes. That was the chain process. Mm -hmm. And so the reading experience, I don't think, entered much into the fatwa. Um, 
when I read it, I, I was entranced by the frame, the, the magical realism frame that, that he put around it because he'd brought that in, which I thought that was very new and fresh for, for, for my reading in, in, in the gang of writers I knew in that generation. Uh, I liked the double, I liked the way he doubled these, these two men uh, uh, landed in the English Channel, um, and one of them turned into the angel Gabriel, the other turned into the devil, and we follow them through contemporary. Britain, and there's a lot of a lot of it. It can be read as this is aerial immigrants, and this is what happens, and this is how they discover this strange island. And then there are the three great dream sequences, one of which we've had there, and Salman's spoken enough for that. I don't need to add to that the changes, which became on examination later the basis for uh, the real, the full pursuit. Because look what he'd done to the sacred text, um, without knowing really what satire was. Uh, and so on. So you had this mass of a book, and I agree with the sentiment which used to be prevalent on this panel that it, I didn't enjoy it as much as, as the two previous uh, books I spoke about, Midnight nice Children and Shame, are, are alluded to. But it was a powerful piece of work, and it was the work of somebody who was a, a very, very powerful and significant writer. Uh, and he was trying all sorts of things out in it, trying different voices, trying his old voice from his deep past, trying his cultural voice from his past, looking at the voices of contemporary Britain, and that's right, Britain in a way. You could say it was a sort of post-colonial revenge. Or you could interpret it in all sorts of different ways. Uh, he piled an immense amount into it, perhaps a little bit too much. But I enjoyed it for what it was, the sort of galloping, expansive, uh, inventive view of this strange event of two people <laughs> landing in the English Channel. And Kevin Immigrants. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so it was only later, of course I know, but I, I, I was brought up in my own religion, Christianity, and I would have noticed, ch I think, changes then to words in the, from the New Testament and so on and so forth. But I wasn't noticing that as much, and I wasn't seeing the significance of that. But Salman's reading obviates any reason to, mm -hmm. uh, for any of us to say any more than, him, than was said there. These were significant changes, mm -hmm. and a sacred text is a sacred text. And uh, the reason I went back to 1626, 1526, because it's exactly the same there. The Bible in Latin was a sacred text. It was, it was God spoke Latin. And that was that. <laughs> and, and, and if you, it had been there since 381. Um, and, 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 uh, and a sacred text, they're powerful things. Uh, and I didn't, get the, I didn't get that until later. But the book, I thought it was enjoyable. I didn't think it was as good as the, the other two. I liked it as much, but it was out there, and it was part of his work, and this was a, a writer of immense, immense, I imagine more than talent. A sort of genius was going on there. Something Nine serious was going on. Intelligence. Really. Yes, and, uh, and he was, and then this other thing turned up, uh, called the fatwa, um, which was another thing. And the, uh, two, these are two other people yourself who reacted briskly to it and got to move on and tried to stop it happening and it, it inflamed the world because partly because it was such a it's interesting what takes the world's fancy and you I think fancy is nothing fancy is the right word in terms of what they pay attention to sometimes it can be a little boy stuck deep in the rubble of somewhere on, in, in some war zone or something and that is the world's attention is devoted can this four-year-old child be rescued and all the other news is put behind it and it's the world thing. It's a one little thing. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of people are in jeopardy. Hundreds are being killed right, left, and center. This little boy. And similarly, with sometimes it happens, and it happened with this book. This one book had an author who was being threatened with death for reasons which were puzzling to most people, and yet it caught the world. Because I think this, the little boy is a sense of profound fear that childhood is being needlessly, mercilessly destroyed. And we can't have that. And this is a chance to show that we can't have it. And this is expression, is being free expression, is being needlessly, stupidly, ignorantly, and with terrible consequences, being checked and stopped. And we don't want that. Mm -hmm. And we come together because it's an instant which you can gather around. It's small enough, but it's strong enough. Yeah. And that's what happened there. And that, it uh, took off, uh, as has been mentioned two or three times on this right. platform. It, it was an attempt to impose a single truth yes. by brutal means. But I think what's interesting is that having written Midnight's Children and Shame, both very political uh, books, hugely political, one against uh, the Indian, uh, the Gandhi, and the other against uh, Pakistan, 
I think Salman felt that Satanic Verses was his least political book. It was a personal story. It was his own journey. He had n no intention, you know, that, he, that, that, that it would be in any way uh, sort of contentious. Um, it, was, it was a personal story. So I think that he was as surprised as anyone when there was, there was this furor. I think he was very surprised. He thought the most satirical thing in the book, apart from Britain and Thatcher and you know, Thatcher's England, was the figure in the midst of it of this imam sitting there, um, mm. you know, dreaming wild dreams. Mm. And that was the point of the satire, not, not the satanic verses themselves. Mm. But, um, you know, there you go. Yasmin, come back to the book and what, what you thought, and then we'll move on to the present and what all this uh, legacy is of this. I, th I think one of the saddest things is that the, pe the people who were protesting hadn't read the book. That was the the one of the biggest shocks I had was, how can you be so agitated and so angry about something you know nothing about and you've not connected with? At least if they had read the book, there would have been an opportunity for some sort of debate on an intellectual level, but it was so... The reaction across the Muslim world, directed from Britain, um, as I said earlier, was absolutely playing to two things. One was that emotion of anger, but the other, for me, was... It was a pivotal point in, in the driving home of that victim narrative of Muslims, which is still so prevalent today. Um, I think that's one of the saddest things. I mean, I know so many Muslims who've read the book and have had to read it um, with a different cover on it. Even to this day, 30 years later, there is still um, mm. a resonance that, that hasn't gone away from the fatwa, even though the fatwa doesn't stand anymore. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. So let, let's try and tease out some of the things that, that were you know, embedded in the Rushdi affair in the fatwa and, and what went on around it and how things have been shaped, in a sense, by it. Because I think not only, you know, was, was this a kind of a totemic moment mm -hmm. for literature and free expression and all the rest of it, but it, but it actually shaped what then came after. Um, Yasmin, how do you think it, it shaped things? I mean, did, did it in your... I think experience? it absolutely did. I think we moved into an era of moving from multiculturalism with, with all of the difficulties that people um, have put forward around that too. A, a, a really terrible policy of multi-faithism which um, has carried on and an identity politics which just divides and subdivides and continues to divide all of us and I think that remains the legacy of um, f for me certainly and particularly within minority communities of um, the whole the whole Rushdie affair um, and there was, you know, there were warnings, and we talk about, you know, we've all talked about the various warnings. I mean, this is this is a book written by Gita Segal and Nira Yuval Davis. It was written in 1995. It warns of what's happening in faith schools, in Muslim schools in this country, and Jewish schools. It talks about the segregation of women and um, the imposition of religious dress codes. It talks about the role of community leaders, how imams have been catapulted to a status that they would never have in a Muslim majority context, where any interaction with um, minority communities is through that, that prism of faith. And it played to communalism. You, you talked about the communalism in India at the time, and it absolutely replicated here. And we're living with the consequences. We've had five terror attacks on this soil this year alone. The place that my parents hail from has, has lost tens of thousands of people to terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've lost a very, very dear friend um, in a suicide attack where he was, he was the target of the attack. Where was this? This was in Pakistan. This was um, a, f a very close friend who's um, um, a police inspector in the northwest frontier province. And on Eid morning, the suicide bomber walked up to him. Um, excuse me. Um, shook his hand and detonated the bomb and killed my friend Saad and took um, 150 other people who were celebrating Eid that day. He leaves behind a widow and three young children and a mother who um, to this day hasn't got over that. We still li live with the legacy of the rise of Islamist ideology and now we have the far right in other faiths standing up saying that they're challenging Islamist ideologies when actually it's, it's all about power, control, um, access to resources. 
in all places. Um, we've had the playing out of the bands um, in terms of Beshti and the Sikh community, um, a play that was banned, sorry. Um, the bombing of Sufi shrines, People go, the imposition of one way of being a Muslim, the denial of cultural rights to millions of Muslims across the world. That was extraordinary. I mean, it was one of, what, I'll just interrupt yeah. you for a minute. It was one of the things at the time I remember. I mean, I, you know, I had a lot of friends from Pakistan or, or wherever. Um, and of course they were Muslim at home, perhaps, mm. um, just as people and all kinds of things, but never had this become an issue of contention. And I remember going around the country doing events, uh, mm. discussing this, and with, with Muslim friends, people I now call Muslim mm. friends. I would never have called them Muslim friends before. And um, they went around explaining to audiences like this and others that there are many, many forms of being Muslim. And of course, nobody had bothered to think about that before. Mm. And, and the, you know, the kind of Islamophobia that we have now, I think is a direct, um, I don't know, legacy like, <coughs> of what came out at that time, because it was clear that people were afraid of the radical brands of Islam, but there were many others, and it was very hard for the many others to mm -hmm. speak, because those were so noisy, because they spoke in violence. And violence is a very persuasive language. It's a very scary language. Caroline. I think one of the... Um one of the things immediately afterwards, after the, um, the, you know, 10 years later when the ban, the fatwa was lifted, and Solman could actually begin to come out and begin to um, be a writer and do what writers do and go and promote their books. And, and I worked at Granta when Haroon came out when he couldn't do anything except Melvin's extraordinary program, which was amazing. But then after that, um, when I was at Random House and we put the satanic verses into, back into Random House, so it joined the rest of his books, but with no imprimatur so that you wouldn't there wouldn't be a retaliation against random house but then the books that came afterwards what i used to like about it because i used to travel with Salman because i was his publicist um, then for a couple of the books and then his publisher and was that we would go to universities we would go to shopping centers we would go to you know anywhere Salman would be out there and people from all races and all you know nationalities and all ages would come to shake his hand and i think there's I think it, it is, we do live in terrible, terrible times. Yeah. But what I loved about our country at that moment was there would always be one or two who would scream hate and rage, but was this absolute coming together that this should not have happened. Um, and whatever they thought about his writing, and many people were not there to buy his books, but they were there to support him. And I remember being always very moved. And, you know, Salman has always said he gets terrible reviews here. And I would say, yes, but actually when we, we go out and we do these tours, and he's on a massive tour in America at the moment with a new book, which is absolutely unputdownable. <coughs> he, um, they are, everybody is there to support. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think that, that I am out here, this is who I am, this is what I've been through, and, you know, we must move forward together and, you know, and acknowledge what went, but not be cowed by it is incredibly important. Yes, yeah. it is very important. And especially now, because I absolutely agree with you, it is, it is, it is, it is unimaginable what's happened to the world mm. from, you know, when we were there those 30 years ago. Yeah. And that, that balance between, you know, violence, incitement, mm. and so-called mm. offence. I mean, you know, offence had, hadn't existed before, as we know. I mean, it just wasn't there. Nobody was offended. Nobody was that frail. Mm. Nobody was that um, offendable. I mean, you know, it just didn't happen. If, if, if we consider that incitement is something which is determined by the context, mm you know, fire in a crowd, et cetera. Uh, would it be the case that now any hate speech is necessarily insightful simply because the context has become so I charged? I think and the parameters have really, shifted. really, really dangerous move. So, so, Francis, tell us, how do you think the parameters, I mean, the, the actual dividing lines between well, free speech uh, in, in its most liberal, think, and yeah. it's never been absolute because free speech is never absolute. We have civility, mm -hmm. we have courtesy, we have all kinds of things. We have book forms of books. I mean, we have genres, which is something that, of course, wasn't recognized at, at, at the, mm -hmm. when books are read in different cultural contexts. But things have shifted. I mean, if you look at America now, there is the possibility of free speech is far more contested. It's much more violent. I think that there is a, certainly a blurring between offensive speech, hate speech, and uh, incitement. And I think that, that 
know if people know what the distinctions are, in, or indeed if we can make those distinctions. One of the things that really shocked me very recently, last week or so, is um, a colleague of mine who is an absolute staunch human rights person defending all kinds of individual human rights, who actually wrote to the government asking what they were going to do in order to stop uh, sort of hate speech about other countries on the public, uh, the public airwaves, as it were. Now, to me, what was extraordinary about that is that this person, who shall remain nameless, clearly believed that we now live in a context where life is so dangerous and there is so much threat from terrorism of all kinds that any hate speech is necessarily incitement. And I think that we have to, 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 to fight that. Um, and when you ask me, you know, how would you define free speech and offence, it's, it's very difficult because these things are determined by the context. Mm. Mm. Um, and even though there may be people who will object hugely to something that is said, I mean, maybe if I said something here and you all objected, uh, it, it shouldn't matter. That's, that's what public discourse is, is, is about. But I think we've lost that. Melvin, would you say we've lost that? It's very difficult, particularly in universities and institutions. Well, you know, this is a sort of, a, yeah, no stunning and all the rest of it, this idea that the academic world um, can decide that they don't want to hear from people. You know, I mean, one of the, the sort of great lessons, and it's one that someone himself used to say, but we as at Article 19, if you don't like something, don't go to it. If you don't want the book, mm. don't read it. Mm. If you don't like it was on the other wireless, turn it off. You know, it's terribly easy. You just turn the switch. Um, but you don't actually have to engage in a sort of, you know, a fatwa-like uh, response simply because something is out there in the world that you don't like. Offence is an absolutely necessary part of the democratic society in which we live. Absolutely. All right, I think, I think we should ask the questions now, yes? And have your views. So could we have the lights up slightly? Yes, just here. Wait for the mics because this is being recorded. And then there's one back there afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. There's one who does remember it as well, being over 55. Um, and one who doesn't have a, uh, a collection of authors as my friends. My little protest was, and I had a, at that time, I had a, a very long commute every day. So I bought the book and read it quite openly on the train. And actually was very disappointed that only one person ever said to me, don't you think it's a bit dangerous? <laughs> um, uh, and also one other comment on Haroon I think is wrongly described as a children's book it's a book that's accessible to children yes. but it's a wonderful book yes. <laughs> it is a wonderful um, Caroline question if I may directly mm. to you um, you say that Salman is now uh, on a tour in, in the States um, an incident which has been ringing in my mind that has happened since then of course was the Charlie Hebdo case where people were actually murdered yeah. um, how, how does he feel I mean yes the fatwa may have been lifted but there are people, and as Yasmin was saying very movingly, you know, there are people who have been offended. Um, surely he must be looking over his shoulder, or is he, is he really just saying what the no, hell? No, I think, I think we'd, all, we'd all say, because we all know him um, you know, very well, that he, when he came out, when he, he went to live in America because the British were much tougher on security, um, and he just was desperate for freedom. So he made his home in New York where he could walk the streets and be completely normal and um, live a normal life. And he's, uh, you know, we, we think, I think we fear more than he does, wouldn't you say, Antonio, that, that he, about his safety, because there is still, every, every time you, you look into anything on the web about someone, it says there are still people who have, you know, money against his name. Um, so, of course, any lunatic could knock him off at any minute, but Salman will never live under fear he is you know he's incredibly courageous and he is a writer and he wants to get about his business and do what writers do and he, he stood up for this charlie hebdo uh, magazine mm. himself and spoke against it very passionately spoke against american pen which was having mm. contro internal controversy mm. about whether um the people who of charlie hebdo who are still there should be given a prize by pen um and a lot of writers said no um and uh, salman was Mm. very much in favor of this prize going to Charlie Hebdo because he said, you know, this is a magazine that had satirized everybody, but when it satirized mm. um, Mohammed mm. or used the image of Mohammed, uh, people were gunned down. It's a very strange But he, what he was dealing with is he, he, he's quite 
clear that he would take his chances as, you know, as an individual, as a writer, maybe who'd offended people. But the difference was we were dealing with state-sponsored, state-sponsored terrorism, mm. and with all the resources that a state has. Yeah. That, that, that was really different. I'm going to take the question back there because the mic is right with you. Yes, you. Thanks very much, um, panel. Um, I must apologize. It's probably a slightly long question, this. But now that the panel has thankfully established that the fatwa and the burning really had political and censorship, if you like, aims very clearly, and given the fact that what Salman said in 1988, what actually said by Philip Hitti, the Arab historian, back in 1960, in fact, he elaborated far more than what Salman did in his. And there was no riots, nothing, back in 1960. Is the lesson, and this is my question, is the lesson for the future that we should do three things? First, we should have an open debate about Islam. Talking about Islam seems now as, well, once you open your mouth, you're stopped. Should we not have a public debate about Islam to understand it better, to see what it is really. Secondly, should we not have allied to that an open debate about women's position in Islam? Yasmin very eloquently alluded to that, but I think we need to have more than that because that goes back beyond Islam. It goes back to the Ur of Chaldees, actually. That's where the culture comes from about suppressing women. Thirdly and finally, should we not have a public debate about the value or otherwise of faith schools? As Yasmin alluded to, <laughs> these could be very difficult places for children to I learn and not to learn critical thinking, which is what we are about today. Well, I Thank would you. answer yes to all of that, but I'm the chair. So, <laughs> um, Melvin and then you, Yasmin. Okay. I couldn't agree more about a big debate. Um, I think we've allowed ourselves to accede, thinking quite rightly in some ways that we're an extremely tolerant nation and that compared to other nations, that's the only way you can talk about yourself in this respect, in this regard, is to compare. Compared with, I think most other nations, we are still a very tolerant nation. The tolerance will out, and I'm not sure it will anymore. I'm sure that action has to be taken, and the sort you're proposing is exactly the sort that I think should be taken. And it isn't political action, I don't think. It's cultural action. And the idea of having a big debate and examination of contemporary Islam in this country now, mm. with people who know about it from inside and have left it or whatever, having it widely exposed and widely debated would be a very big step forward. The ignorance about it is enormous. Um, and one of the reasons why the riots got underway, I think in Bradford about the book, is that people were so enraged there about being thought of as terrible second race that they wanted something to protest about and to say, we are people. We have voices. And where they used that, the, 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 <laughs> the satanic verses were used again and again for other means. Yep. And that was they're using it for a voice. We have a voice here. We in Bradford have a voice. We want to express the voice. And mistakenly, for they did it that way. I think an enlightenment uh, policy to inform as many people possible, as much as possible would be wonderful. The, there are great difficulties in the way, but it's not impossible. And I think the BBC would have a big responsibility here. And I think that all, some of the newspapers could take it far more seriously than they do because they're leading us down dangerous paths by allowing prejudices to go unchallenged, by allowing ignorance to go, to leave it as ignorance and not enlighten people. That is very, very important. And your point about faith schools is something that's extremely deep in this country as in other countries, but let's just talk about these countries. To uproot them would be uh, something that you I don't think it would be possible to do in the sense of using that word, like get hold of a root and pull it out. To talk about them, to discuss them, to see what's happening there, uh, to find out whether what is happening there is dangerous from an early stage is essential. Uh, 
because these produce later alienations that simply can't be mended. We know that. We've just seen in Northern Ireland, to take a milder example, this estate that they built quite recently, four years ago, to have Catholics and Protestants together, sort of a Milton Keynes of Northern Ireland in its own small way, breaking up. The Catholics are moving out because, they, as they see it, the Northern Ireland Protestants are persecuting them too much and they're moving away. It's very deep and where did it start? At school. Give me the boy until he's seven, or the girl. Well, they didn't talk about girls in those days when they made up these statements. <laughs> give me the person, the boy, and I will give you the man. And you're right, that's the way to go to it. So general education is massively lacking. And what we get are fundamentalist slogans and attacks on fundamentalist, fundamentalist slogans fundamentally. Now they're any good. And faith schools must be brought into the light and talked about. And so they are there and they are there maybe. That's OK. But not hidden away as sort of these long fuses which will blow up in our faces when these children go into men and women. Yasmin, would you like to have a go yeah. at um, commenting on that? Oh, gosh. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I campaign against faith schools. I, I sometimes wonder, I mean, I, I say it's apartheid because I wonder on what other basis we would divide our children. Um, and on one level, we've got a government policy that talks about the need for better integration, more cohesive communities, and yet in the same, um, at the very same time, the same token that there's, they're funding faith schools and segregating communities along those lines, as they are doing uh, um, across other services. Um, Tolerance, I think, is a really interesting thing, Melvin, because I think, um, oh my God, I've just used the Lord's first name. Um, I think... Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll put that I, th I, think so I, I think Britain's a wonderful place. It's my home. I can't <coughs> imagine living anywhere else. Um, when my father came here in the 50s, he said, we're never, you know, he said to my mother, don't ever dream about going back to Pakistan because there's nothing there for us where this is home. And this is what, you know, as a family, we've, we've, our roots are here. But the tolerance that, that I think appears to be tolerance at one level is actually political expediency at another. We'd had the Oldham riots before the book came out. Um, the Cantle report talks about segregated communities. And I think some of the government's kowtowing to those religious leaders has been, um, and I've, I've written about this, and in, it's in Refusing Holy Orders as well, of saying to community leaders, if you can control your angry young men and stop them rioting on our streets, we will fund the things that you want. You can have your faith schools, you can put your women into hijabs, you can have your Sharia courts, um, but just keep control of your angry young men. And that seems to be a policy that continues up until now with the whole counter-extremism um, agenda. Do you agree that it started back then, Yasmin? Because I always thought that it became stronger then because people wanted to talk, politicians mm. wanted to talk to Muslim leaders and the only leaders that seemed to be visible were faith leaders. I think and this has its roots these in... These were bearded old men, I yeah. mean, you know. I think this has its roots in colonialism. I think if you look at British rule in India, in, in yeah. Africa, in East Africa, other parts of the world, it's 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 been a policy position that's been adopted for hundreds of years and um, it saves you talking to all the other people if you've got a community leader who you, know, um, you can access and, and um, exert power through. In terms of the debate about Islam, Islam's been debating for as long as Islam has been around. Um, the thing that's different now is that there was space for debate in centuries past. Um, as a Muslim, if I stand up and, I mean, I, I, I challenge the hijab. I think it's cultural. I don't think it's religious. Um, you know, I, I'm, faith schools, um, dress codes, um, demands by Muslims for, you know, changing the exam timetable during Ramadan, a whole host of things that some of our community leaders have been demanding, um, I would stand up against. But one of the things I find really disappointing is there is no support from the non-Muslim community when those of us from within our community stand up and say enough. What kind of support would you want? Well, not to be labelled an Islamophobe would be a start. Um, and that's been something that's happened from certainly from the political left, but much more so from the political right. And it is a very difficult line 
to raise issues within communities, forced marriage, on a base violence, female genital mutilation, and not to feed that anti-Muslim narrative, but to silence all forms of dissent as Islamophobic, is deeply, deeply dangerous. Mm. And we have to be much more grown up about this. We have to have those conversations about racism and structural inequality. But equally, we have to have a conversation about human rights what is it that we collectively, from all our different positions as a nation, what are the fundamentals? Where were those red lines? Where will we say, this is what it means to be a citizen of the world? These are these universal rights that we will stand by and we will fight for. And we seem to have got lost. I mean, the Human Rights Act itself is under threat at the moment. Um, and that worries me. But the silencing of dissent is dangerous. My, I've met, mentioned Gita a couple of times. She's Gita Segal, who made a film about that um, called The Hullabaloo of the Satanic Verses, um, which documents the, the Women's March. Gita lost her job at Amnesty because she spoke out against Moazin Beg. The group, the, the um, Women Against Fundamentalism, disbanded because of the tensions within within the group. Because of this, we've all gone off and. Um, formed different things. We, we've got a, a coalition that's fighting Sharia courts. The Home Affairs Select Committee would not take evidence from us. They would not hear from us. Eventually, when two were allowed to speak, one was an ex-Muslim and another was an academic from Geneva, we were outnumbered 10 to 2 and repeatedly called um, Islamophobes. The, um, the inquiry that's headed up by Mona Siddiqui, when we challenged that, we put an open letter out into, um, into the, I think the Times published it. We were dismissed as arrogant women. We're women who were standing up saying that Muslim women and women of faith deserve the same justice that women of no faith or our white sisters in this country deserve. That needs to be supported. Stand with us. <laughs> Um, I think, do you, there was a question here. Oh, sorry, the mic's gone elsewhere. There, could you come to here and afterwards? No, it's all right. Do that one and then straight to you. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for sharing. I mean, this is, you know, the, 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 the type of archive that we're gathering. It's so valuable. I haven't read uh, Salman Rushdie's autobiography, Joseph Anton. Maybe perhaps you have. Um, just a couple of things. I mean, I think one of his biggest legacies is, is clearly, and Caroline probably knows about this, is just the incredible encouragement that it, it gave to Indian writing in English. And you know, right now, even the talented generation of Pakistani writers. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of actually critically evaluating Salman Rushdie's uh, novels, and I read quite a few, I don't think it creates memorable characters. I just somehow think there's lovely language, large sort of canvases, but it doesn't sometimes get into the psychological sort of interiority of the character. So, you know, even if I were to ask you, what do you think of Mahoon as a character? Or Salman, what were his motives? The, the one that's there. And that may be part of what I think, because these were, you're right, they were just excerpted out and just passed around. And what people read were these caricatured, very sort of very contrived ways in, in, in almost being an attempt to provoke. Um, and I think that what was very interesting about Salman, okay, I'm going to be very quick, is, you know, he wanted to represent the Muslim community in a certain way. So he had a reformist agenda of sorts, because what happened immediately after the book and with Dame Antonia and Harold Pinter's speech. So I'm just wondering, did you ever get a sense that he got, he got into reflecting? What was he, he, it was a personal book, but he also wanted a certain statement to be made. And it I don't came think out this in is ways. Correct, and I think I'm going to have to stop you because it's a very long question. I, I don't think that's correct either in literary terms or in extra literary terms. The book is, in many respects, a satire, and satire always works along these kinds of two dimensions in one respect. But um, let me take one more question, and then we'll we'll answer both together because time is running out. If you could pass it there, thank you. I was on the board of Article 19 at the time, and I remember thinking then, and a few years later, when Sikh extremists were able to close down a theater with threats of violence, that the government was extremely 
week. In, and perhaps we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today if there had been more strength at the time because of a softness towards tolerance, multiculturalism, the new ideology of not laying down a bottom line. We don't burn books in this country. We don't let threats of violence stop plays. And it didn't happen. And I wonder if the panel agrees. Francis, we'll come to you first on that. What can I say? Yes. <laughs> um, absolutely. But I mean, you know, again, it goes back to the one of the one of the outcomes it seems to me about the uh, it's called the Rushdie affair is that it actually gave a kind of blueprint to a number of groups thereafter in the last 20 years who wished to intimidate they saw that it worked and it did work for a while i mean it didn't work in the sense that it stopped someone writing but it did work in that it became headline news and i think that you know that was very very dangerous and the shilly-shallying, the wobble of the government at the time, because believe you me, well, I mean, you know that very well, but um, it was a really, really hard job to keep the government from reneging completely on this issue. And it wasn't that we were there sort of saying, you know, you've got to love Salman. We were talking about a principle, a principle which actually governs, or not governs, but I mean, runs as a thread through the society for many centuries. And I do think that the government did shilly-shally about it. And, you know, because it was became such a political issue and because, you know, ugh, at the risk of sounding terribly naive, uh, politics is about short-term, short, short, short term, you know, uh, the electorate, it's not to do with. I remember once, for instance, um, not John Major, it was um, Hugh Douglas, uh, Hugh, Hugh who sort of said, no, we can't do that, he said, because it wouldn't be right. And I was terribly, terribly struck by that. I mean, it was many years ago when he was, uh, before, after he was a prime minister. And I don't know now whether you would get senior politicians to stand up and say, no, we can't do that because it wouldn't be right. I think that they say, no, we can't do that because our electorate wouldn't buy it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, I, 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 I absolutely obviously agree with that. Okay, I'm afraid we're running to the close of time, but did you, you had your hand up before, did you? I'll take one last question, if it's I, quick. Thank you, forgive me for not standing up. I've uh, hurt my knee and need, need, I need an operation. Um, question to the whole panel. Um, I understand the sensitivities of the time, i.e. with Terry Waite and the hostages, so the government sort of had one hand tied behind its back, but if this was to happen today, um, would the government be as supportive and robust in doing the right thing? Um, question to no, everyone, if I may. Not. <laughs> no, I don't think there's any discussion here. I mean, things have got much worse, I, I suspect. Yes. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm talking from the chair, but... <laughs> um, would anybody like to have sort of... I'm not too sure. Okay. I think we're all... I think there's a... We've got to be... I, you're not going to like this. Uh, we've got to be careful of honour and pessimism. There's quite a few things wrong, but there's an awful lot that's right. There are an awful lot of people, like the gentleman back there and the gentleman there, and particularly this lady on my left, who are working to change things in a better way uh, than they've done for decades. That's going on. Other things are happening which are catching our attention more because it's become an inflammatory headline situation. Something happens and it's in the papers. If it had happened 15, 20 years ago, it would not have been in the papers. It's now a running story. And the fatwa was, was one of the views. It's one of the views that set that off. I think that there may be the... I, I'm in a very difficult position. Because to say anything favorable about the bunch of people who run this country at the moment is extremely difficult. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think that they would be persuaded by a substantial force of public opinion to behave well. And one of the things that would enable them to behave well, encourage them to behave well, was precisely what we've been talking about tonight. Because we could say, look what happened when you didn't. Look what happened uh, when the fat was good. Look what happened. There's an example. 
So I don't despair uh, at all. I'm not Mary Poppins, you may have noticed. Um, <laughs> but I don't despair. And I think that despair is giving in. Despair is a form of surrender. And once we start doing that, we really are finished. There's a lot of spunk in this country. There's a lot of prejudice. There's a lot of ill feeling, bad feeling. But there's a great, there's a great deal of good feeling. That has to be tapped too. And what we fail to tap across the board, I think, governments and leaders, is to tap into good feeling by bad policies and mediocre leadership mm. and other things. But I don't think it's gone. And I think to say, oh, we will just roll over where somebody's book to be burned on the same principle is wrong. And I think that the ground is being laid for a better place by the work being done by, as been on my left here. Uh, on the left is a quite a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that note, Melvin. I Caroline just, I just wanted to, to, um, to add one other thing, and actually it was to your point, because I think um, the great positivism, or one of the great positives, is the writers in the world that we live in. You know, like Salman, like Alif Shafak, like many writers who are writing novels um, and non-fiction to just open our eyes and help us and encourage us to take a stand. Um, and I completely disagree with you about Salman's stories. I think he's the greatest storyteller, one of the greatest, and his characters live forever. And read the new one. Nero Golden is one of the best <laughs> characters in literature today, I think. Well, thank you for that, Caroline. And thank you, Melvin, for giving us hope. And thank you all for, for, for you know, taking part in this event. I think it was an important moment, and I think we're thinking about the legacy. Oh, Yasmin, no, yes, please, can final word. End with one thing. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm as optimistic as, as Melvin, but um, there, there is huge dissent. There are incredibly brave people fighting, not just Islamist ideology, but Nazi ideology in this country as well. And I think um, I just wanted to leave with the slogan from the Women of the March, our tradition, struggle, not submission. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tim Roberts, I'm the director of the Royal Society of Literature. Just, I just have 30 seconds of thank yous, and I do want to say that you heard it here first that Melvin Bragg is not Mary Poppins. And I, you know, that, um, uh, at the Royal Society of Literature, we're very proud to be part of Banned Books Week, and w alongside uh, our partners in that, Islington Libraries, Index on Censorship, uh, and uh, the Free Word Centre, and of course the British Library here. Uh, and special thanks to Zoe Wilcox and Jonathan Pledge for their work on tonight's event. Uh, thank you very much to all of you and to great questions and to our audiences in Exeter, Poole, Sheffield and Huddersfield. Good night to you as well. Uh, and uh, there are, the bar is open. Please join us for a drink. There's also a book stall, including Selling Salman's uh, new book. Can I say that at the Royal Society of... And, uh, <laughs> uh, can I just say as well from the Royal Society of Literature that we're very proud that Salman Rushdie is one of our fellows. Uh, and uh, then above all, could we say a very big thank you to uh, the chair of the Royal Society of Literature and tonight's chair, Lisa Pignanese. Uh, and thank you very much, Lisa. <laughs> and to our panel, Francis D'Souza, Melvin Bragg, Caroline Michelle, and uh, uh, Yasmin Raymond. Yasmin, thank you very much. <laughs>